I have made the first major change in violin making in over 300 years, and that's very gratifying. I feel very good that I've contributed something that I'll be remembered by, something that is going to make a difference. I think it's unbelievable because he's not a violinist at all. And, and the, most violin makers, they know how to play the violin. It, it seems like they have to be. I mean, they might not be very good violinists, but they have to be able to play or have been trained in music. And a person who's not a musician at all, who cannot play the instrument, has come up with this amazing idea, innovation, and that the result being so good, it's, it's, it should be impossible. I feel if I'm not doing something constantly or contributing to society, whether it's in a small way or a large way, I'm not really utilizing my talents. Today on Summit of Life, we follow the international journey of a young, talented professional engineer who had a burning desire to make radical changes to the production and design of traditional Italian violins. We'll find out what inspired Len John to create this unique instrument, how he overcame enormous opposition from the music world, and what it took to turn his dream into reality, right here on Summit of Life. I believe focus is one of the key ingredients. Passion. I want to use that inspiration in a creative way. I, I really want it to, to make a difference in the world. Len grew up in Pakistan, where he first discovered his love for all things aeronautical. Even as a very young boy, he had a keen interest in airplanes, and this interest quickly evolved into a burning desire to be in aviation, not just for a hobby, but for a lifelong career. My interest in aviation goes back to my childhood. My father was a commissioned officer in the Royal Air Force, um, and ever since I remember, I've grown up around airplanes living around air bases. Uh, model airplanes was my hobby, and uh, I think it was a foregone conclusion that my higher education and training would all be in the aerospace industry. Flying was always a love, so I obtained my pilot's license, and I fly as often as I can, as many different types as I can. Len emigrated to London, England, where he pioneered the use of a revolutionary carbon fiber composite material that would later be used for the first time ever in helicopters. Armed with this incredible expertise, he moved to Toronto, Canada, where he was immediately scooped up by the former de Havilland aircraft, now Bombardier Aerospace, to work on maximizing the use of composite materials on the revolutionary regional aircraft, the Dash 8. There, he channeled his immense knowledge and ambition, perfecting the use of high-strength fibers. Today, in fact, the, the Canadian aircraft industry is the third largest uh, commercial aircraft industry in the world. Len John and his work on composites in the 80s and 90s is certainly a key part of that progress. As well as his love of aircraft, Len has always had an affinity for classical music. A fan of the Toronto Symphony, he was saddened to learn that many of the beautiful old violins had begun to deteriorate, many of them becoming too fragile to play. As a result, this clever, creative engineer began to dream. And he didn't stop dreaming until he had created the world's first graphite violin. I decided I'm going to make a violin utilizing graphite. The violin project was very unique. I started that in 1978. And in that time period, I attended Toronto Symphony quite a lot. I knew the concert master at that time. And one day I read in the newspaper that his priceless violin cracked up in the dry Canadian winters. And I started thinking that there's got to be a better way to produce this instrument, not detracting from the age-old art of violin making, but possibly using today's materials, which were much more advanced. 
So in 1978, I was working with a colleague of mine who used to make wooden instruments, and I said, I'm going to make a graphite instrument, and he said, it's impossible. I said, I'll make two, and I'll give you one. And that's how it started, and uh, I had no idea. I couldn't even hold a violin. I certainly don't play the violin. And uh, I went to the library and I got a book that was written in Old English. It was over a hundred years old then. I taught myself everything I know today. Uh, made my own mold, a single small mold. Produced two instruments. Len branched out a little bit into non-aeronautical things, used his materials, knowledge and expertise particularly in this violin, which he, which he produced uh, 20 years ago, which is a brilliant application of, of knowledge and expertise from the aerospace industry. Um, and it was so marvelous to see such an elegant thing as a, as a violin to be recreated in modern technology. For the first time in the history of Italian violin making, Len had leapfrogged over 300 years of musical tradition, changing the design and production of this classic instrument much to the horror of the stuffy classical music establishment. I thought this is it. It's a big challenge. It's not going to be accepted in the very staunch violin world. Here I'm going away from a traditional wood which has curly maple on the back with a very nice flame and on top is pine and is carved and very, very rich to look at. And along I was coming with a silky sheen black graphite violin, and how would this be accepted? There are some wonderful builders still around, and anything like this is a vagary, and they just don't want to know about a so-called plastic violin. So there were lots of problems. When I tried to get an appraisal, uh, people wouldn't even look at the instrument, because if it wasn't from Cremona, Italy, dated 1735 or thereabouts, there was no interest in the, in the instrument. Len's disappointment deepened when members of his much-loved Toronto Symphony Orchestra refused to play it. And then, the gods smiled on Len. The editor of the prestigious Strad magazine in London, England, gave it an excellent review. When we come back, we'll find out how Len's invention not only garnered a U.S. patent, but also a prestigious spot in the who's who of the world. This unique violin is also now recognized as a national treasure by the federal government. More on that when Summit of Life returns. Leonard John's desire to be recognized for producing a viable alternative to traditional violin making was soon to be fulfilled. At long last, his graphite violin was given the honor it deserved, with the federal government deeming it of outstanding significance and national importance. The black violin caught the imagination of the national media and was featured on radio, television, and in print. Suddenly, Len's violin was a hit. Overnight, everyone who was anyone in the violin world wanted to play it and experience the black violin. Itzhak Perlman was here rehearsing at Massey Hall, and uh, he test played it, encouraged me to continue with the project. That's how it started. Later on, uh, Moshe Hammer, a very well-known violinist, played it for a CBC interview with myself on Arts National. and. Um, he loved the sound. The high notes were incredible. Better, in fact, than uh, the Granarius. I was invited by NASA, actually in the daytime, to give a lecture on bird impact on aircraft structure. And in the evening, I had to give a lecture to the NASA engineers on the violin. And it turned out to be a very popular event. And I took the instrument down. And there I met a very interesting person. Baron Joel Ferrin, 
And Dr. Joe Ferrin is a celebrated cellist and violinist. And he was uh, initially very skeptical, but he had a student of his there and she played it. Once he heard it, he totally turned around. And today he's one of my biggest supporters. So there were challenges there, but I overcame them. And I made my prototypes. I made initial two, then the Canadian government commissioned me to build three more which uh, in the 80s traveled all across Canada. It was promoted under a theme, Bravo Canada, as Canadian innovation. It opened the CNE in Toronto, uh, the Pacific National Exhibition in Vancouver, and the exhibition in Quebec. And for one year, they were traveling exhibits. I would assume that the, that the inspiration for doing this is the technical challenge to see if it, uh, if, uh, if it could in fact have an impact on, a, on an old technology. And I think the achievement of it must have been very satisfying for him. And yes, along the line, I could have uh, dropped it because years went by and I wouldn't get acceptance. Today, clearly, is the way of the future now. Loving husband of 23 years and father of two, Len credits his family with providing him the stable and supportive environment necessary for his creativity to flourish. Len is a very loving and a caring person. And uh, he's a good husband, a good father. I tell my friends, they're like, yeah, my dad makes violins. They're like, how? I'm like, in the oven. <laughs> they're like, right. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, he's told us how, like, the differences between other violins don't make much sense to us, but, you know, it's a change, you know, it's acknowledged. It's pretty cool, you know. I think it's a great thing he's done. His violin is a great achievement, and all the different materials that he makes his violins out of. And it's the first one, so. I think it's pretty good. About 15 years ago, National Geographic contacted Len to do a feature article on the violin. It was to be played by a rising young star of the Ontario Conservatory of Music, Zhang Zhang, who at the tender age of 15 had already played with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. I went with my mother to the Royal Conservatory and Len was there and he handed me this violin. It was black. And I remember thinking, what is this? I've never seen a violin this color before. And he explained to me that this is not wood, it's made out of airplane material. I think in plain words he explained to me so that I can understand that it was made out of the same material as an airplane. Both my mother and I were very surprised. And I was even more surprised when I played it because it sounded so good. The photo shoot was a success and Len was gratified by the worldwide honor this article would bestow upon him. He subsequently lost contact with the violinist and didn't hear from her again. Just this past summer, Len attended the Monaco Grand Prix following his other passion, Formula One. Amid all the hobnobbing with celebs and drivers, Len was stopped in his tracks by the sounds of a beautifully played violin. He followed the music to its source to find none other than Zhang Zhang, now one of the principal violinists for the Monte Carlo Symphony Orchestra. They became reacquainted, and Zhang promised to visit Toronto so that she would have the honor of playing the black violin one more time. Now, after all these years and having had more exposure to different violins, I'm even more impressed with the quality, and I think it's improved since the first um, first instrument because now there's a bass bar and it's. The quality is much more even, and um, the projection is great, and it's very easy to play. And the, the proportions are perfect, and I would love to have an instrument like that. Len's love of music goes back many years and has translated into a passion for collecting antique musical instruments gathered from all over the world. His complete collection is estimated at approximately a quarter of a million dollars. These are some of my uh, musical instruments that I've collected over the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, they're not the whole collection, some of them are in storage, but I'll show you some of these. This is a sitar, size 12, and uh, this one I had custom made in 1980 when I got married in Lahore. And I actually went to the store and picked the gourd, because this is a, a vegetable that uh, produces a sitar. And this is another thing I want to look at to see if I can change the traditional 
gourd, which is uh, quite a lot of changes over time, and see if I can use uh, graphite for this. Here is a bazooki that I picked up in Athens, and this was also actually picked up in 1980. Beautiful instrument, and uh, again, wood, and another great candidate for uh, graphite. And this is labeled as a Carlo Bergonzi, who was a very well-known uh, maker. Um, if it is indeed a Carlo Bergonzi, then this is extremely valuable, and I can't really place a figure other than to tell you that it's tens of thousands of dollars and I almost broke it up to utilize the parts on my graphite violin and then uh, we found out that it may be an original. And of course this is the graphite violin, uh, the one that I use as my demonstrator. This one is number six, serial number six. There's only eight that exist in the world that I built. This is the sixth one and this is one of three that the Canadian government commissioned me to build. So this is one of them that toured all over Canada. When we come back, we'll hear more about Len's violin and his hopes for its future, right here on Summit of Life. Len's vision for his graphite violin has always been an altruistic one. He saw its application as a teaching tool to the masses to be used by music students all over the world. Schools today are using cheaper instruments. They're coming from various countries in the Far East. And although they looked very nice, they couldn't tune them. Children, when they're beginning to play violin, especially in a school environment where there's one teacher to a lot of kids, you know, like a youth orchestra, there's no time for the teacher and there's not enough people to make sure the instruments are taken care of the right way. I've seen children, you know, damage violins without wanting to, just because the instruments are so delicate, made out of wood. And this would be great for, you know, schools. Because as Len said, if you pour a bottle of water over it, you could still play it. And that's amazing. There's so many benefits. I mean, for me personally, if I had a violin like this, and, and, and I speak for I think, other professionals like myself, we do a lot of outdoor concerts as well, where the weather and the climate, the humidity, I mean, it affects violin enormously. Len's violin is perfect. So mine will go on forever. It could be 500 years, 1,000 years. It's always good. The other important thing is my violin doesn't have any varnish. So there's nothing to deteriorate with age. I think it's great that through everything he's gone through, he still wants to achieve more and he, he's never wanted to give up or anything. And that inspires us too, that you know we should just keep on going and do what we want. And I'm proud of him. Len's graphite violin is the fulfillment of a long-held dream, but the flame of imagination in this industrious engineer can never be extinguished. Len has shifted gears with his current passion, the design of race cars. I'm always looking for a challenge. It doesn't matter whether I have challenges at work, which I certainly do all the time, um, but I'm always looking for personal challenges outside that to keep me going and uh, I've always been interested in race cars. And indeed, watching anxiously is Derek Walker. Derek. One of the people I've got to know very well is Stefan Johansson. Stefan is a, a very celebrated ex-Formula One driver for Ferrari, many other teams. And uh, in fact, I'll be going within a month to Indianapolis to his headquarters and see what I can do with my knowledge and background in composites, because all the cars are 
graphite fibers and so on. And I'm going to help them to try and rigidize their cars, get increased stiffness, get the weight out, redistribute the weight, and see what I can do. I'm very interested in that. They're very keen to have me you know, work with them. And this is all because of my interest. It's not really a business venture. I just love doing this. Many of the race car engineers and designers uh, got their start as, as aerospace designers. The principles, the challenges, the technology are very, very similar to aerospace. So lens move across to, uh, to racing cars will be entirely in, in character and entirely uh, consistent with his background and his expertise. Uh, I'm sure he'll do well at it. I think with Lynn anything is possible. I think, you know, he's made airplanes, he's made cars, he's made violin. I mean, how far can that be, you know, from racing cars or airplanes to, to violins? I think anything's possible. I think someone like Lynn, whose curiosity in life in general and whose, you know, motivation to, to always do something new, to learn something new, anything is possible. I, I, I can't imagine what he'll do next, but I think I won't be surprised. And I think whatever he does, it will be just as good and just as exciting. I'm sure of it. As famous philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Leonard John enthusiastically continues to dream. His inspiration knows no bounds. If you know someone with an amazing story to tell, pass the details along through our website at summitoflife.com. Until next time, I'm Randy Taylor. Thanks for watching and be well.